started uh, the death. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We cannot be this dead on a Saturday. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. That's more like it. How's everybody doing? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. It's good to see everybody back again. Inshallah uh, for another session of the solar compass. Um, إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على سيدنا ورسوله وخاتم الأنبياء وعلى آله الأسكياء وأصحابه الأتقياء أما بعد اللهم إنا نسألك حبك وحب من يحبك وحب عمل يقربنا إلى حبك Oh Allah, we ask you for your love and the love of whom those you love and the love of the actions that you love يا رب العالمين Welcome back to another session of Solar Compass. Uh, sisters, if you feel the need to open one side of the curtain, you guys can. If not, we can keep it as it is. Inshallah, um, this is what? Our fourth session of Solar Compass, alhamdulillah. Um, I know we haven't had one in a month because we had Mufti Kamani come uh, that, that weekend, so um, which was a great weekend, alhamdulillah. But Basically, to recap, for everybody who's new uh, to this, what solar compasses, we are covering the book of Imam al Ghazali, which is called Ya Ayyuhal Walad. And this book, which means um, My Dear Son, Ya Ayyuhal Walad, My Dear Son, this book is covering one of the students of Imam al Ghazali wrote him a letter. A student of Imam al Ghazali wrote him a letter. And he said, yeah, Imam, and this student has studied with Imam al-Ghazali for over 20 years. So he said, yeah, Imam, I want you to give me pieces of advice. Give me pieces of advice so that I can act upon these pieces of advice and I can use these pieces of advice in my daily life so I can be a better Muslim, get closer to the deen of Allah. Yeah, Imam, give me pieces of advice. He wrote him a letter. Imam al-Ghazali wrote back a book, <laughs> right? It was, he also wrote back a letter, but later on that letter was compiled back into a book. Now we have each week we cover a few pieces, or each, each session we cover a few pieces of advice. And this week we're covering um, another piece of advice that is very crucial inshallah. But we've covered about four pieces of advice so far. We've covered about four pieces of advice in this book. Now I'm going to test some of you guys' memory to see if you guys remember what we've talked about. I know it's been a while, um, but who can name a piece of, we've covered four, who can give me at least a general idea? And sorry sisters, I can't see your hands, but let's go with the guys for now. Who can give me a general idea of what we've covered? What's the first piece of advice? Should I just recap? Feels like everybody's, uh, out of it today. We'll recap. First piece of advice. He says, Imam al Ghazali starts off by saying, "Alam ayyuhal walad al muhibbul aziz." He is when he talks back to his student. He says, "No, oh my dear son, al muhib al aziz." Imam al Ghazali starts off with showing love, even though he is hujjat al Islam, right? This is Imam al Ghazali. Shaykh al Shuyukh, right? But look how he shows love to a student. Al Muhib al Aziz, my dear beloved son. And then he makes dua for his student. He says, Allah He says, May Allah make your life long and may He allow you to live your life close to the ones that Allah loves, making dua for him, right? And then he goes on. And he tells him, my dear beloved son, he says, 
why are you asking me questions? Because every answer I'm going to give you is going to come from the Sunnah and the Quran. So what do you need me for? Go search for them. You don't need me. You've been studying Islam for 20 years. Why do you need me to give you answers? Because everything I'm going to give you is going to come from the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad and it's going to come from the Quran. So therefore, I'm a nobody. I'm a nobody. That's what he first. This is him showing what? Being humble, who he is. And then also showing respect to the Prophet Muhammad And he goes on. And he says, Ayyuhal walid. And he says, From what the Prophet وسلم, has advised his ummah. The second piece of advice he says, Ya Ayyuhal walid. That the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he advised his ummah. And what did he tell his ummah? He said, do not spend time with things that have no benefit to you. A'lam, know, right? He says, عَلَامَةُ إِعْرَاضِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَىٰ عَنِ الْعَبْدِ إِشْتِغَالُهُ بِمَا لَا يَعْنِيهِ One of the signs Allah has put his servants, won't even look at him, is by making this person busy with things that have nothing to do with them. Nothing. This is a sign Allah has neglected, pushed you to the side. Not even looking at you, right? He starts off with that. So he's showing to his student, he's saying, if you're spending a lot of time with things that don't benefit you whatsoever, then understand and know this is a alama. This is a alama from Allah that this is iradullah alayk. This is Allah neglecting you. She's kind of pushing you to the side, right? So he, he, he goes right into that. Then he moves on and gives another piece of advice. And this is a crucial one. He says, Ya ayyuhal walad, nasihatu sahla wal mushkila qubuluha. He says, giving advice is very easy and it's simple. Anybody can give advice. Whether you're an older person, younger person, rich person, poor person, whatever it is, you have something to share. We all have opinions. We can all give advice. But the issue about advice is that accepting the advice. Anybody can give you advice. But how do you accept the advice and how do you implement the advice, right? And then he says, he, this is where he starts hounding people. He says, وَعْلَمْ أَنَّ الْعِلْمَ الْمُجَرَّدَ لَهُ سَيَكُونُ نَجَاتُهُ وَخَلَاصُهُ فِيهِ وَأَنَّهُ مُسْتَغِنْ عَنِ الْعَمَلِ He says, know that if there's a person who thinks just because, look at me, I'm a sheikh, look at me, I have knowledge, look at me, I studied at this school, I studied at this school, and he thinks that this is enough for him to go to Jannah, then this person is a little bit crazy up here. Knowledge alone is not going to be enough for you to go to Jannah. It's not enough. Al-ilm bila amal is nothing. Knowledge without action is nothing. It means nothing. Right? So he's saying, he starts hounding this point all throughout the next pieces of advice. And then he goes on and he continues about Al-Junaid. Al-Junaid, he says this very famous uh, story of Al-Junaid. Al-Junaid was a scholar in the past who had passed away. And Al-Junaid was seen in a dream by one of his students. And they asked him, Ya Junaid, ma al-khabr Ya Junaid, what's going on Ya Junaid? How's things in the barzakh Ya Junaid? And Junaid replies back and he says, Tahat tilka al-isharat. He says, every single example I've given is gone. Wa faniyat tilka al-ibarat. And every, everything that I told the people flew away. I, I, don't, I don't have it. Every lecture I've given is gone. Every khutbah I've given is gone. Everything we've posted on Mass Colorado, every, gone. Nothing, nothing is left. The only thing that's left and the only thing that's benefited me in the grave, إلا ركيعات ركعناها في جوف الليل. He says, only a few rak'ahs I prayed in the middle of the night, that's the only thing that's been able to benefit me in my grave. What does that mean? These are two rak'ahs he prayed between him and Allah. The sincerity piece, that's where it comes in. When you are worshiping Allah when nobody else is around you, you are straight, just you and Allah, nobody's there. That's where the sincerity piece falls into place. And he talks about sincerity in the fourth advice. And he talks about, um, and he talks about the shahada. He says, what do you say about those people? We talked about the concept of um, those people who say, I don't need religion to be a good person. I don't need to believe in Allah to be a good person. Or the people that say, uh, brother, I don't need to wear hijab to be a good Muslim. 
Brother, I don't need to pray to be a good Muslim. I'm a good person. I treat people good. I don't need to do any of this. But in fact, Islam, good is subjective to me and you. What's good to this person is not good to the other person. Just like last session, we asked what's good to Bilal and what's good to so-and-so. They had two different answers. One person said, a good person to me is somebody who can make me laugh. Another person said, a good person to me is somebody who's kind. Two different definitions of good. So how can we understand what good is when it's different for everybody, right? When somebody tells me, I don't need to believe in Allah, I'm a good person, I don't need religion, I'm a good person. But we have Islam. Islam gives us the definition of good. And the definition of good is in Al-Arqam. Right? Psalm Ramadan. Al-Shahadatu an la ilaha illallah. Was salah. Right? Zakat. Go on the Hajj. Believing in Allah and His oneness. That's to us as a Muslim, that tells us what's a good person. He carries these five characteristics. The five pillars of Islam. Right? So when people say, what do you say about the person who says, all I say, and what, what Imam al-Ghazali is trying to do is he's trying to get to you and tell you that if you're not acting about what you believe, then it means nothing. But what about the person who says, the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad says, whoever says, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, truly, sincerely, ihtisab and sincerely believes in it, then he goes to Jannah. Is this a right hadith or no? This hadith sahih. Sah. Whoever says it, La ilaha illallah, it's enough for him to go to Jannah. But the issue is, when does he go to Jannah? When? It's not about yes or no, but when does he arrive to Jannah? How long does it take this person to get to Jannah? Because a person who was fasting 70 Ramadans in a row, just like there's a, there's a hadith about the shaheed and the person who fasted, they're in line to go to Jannah. The person who fasted goes in before the shaheed. How? Yes, you're a shaheed. But this person got to fast more Ramadans than you. This person got to pray more than you. So his destination, he goes in before you. Right? So yes, everybody who says, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, inshaAllah will make it to Jannah. But when will they make it to Jannah? Remember, the day of judgment is 50,000 years long. Who makes it first and who makes it last, that's going to play a toll. Right? A 12-hour flight is not the same as a one-hour flight. We all can agree on that. So that was the last thing we covered. Um, and we said that Al Hassan al Basri Yaqul, um, he says, Allah Ta'ala, Yaqul Allah Ta'ala, Li Ibadi Yom al Qiyama, Udhulu Ya Ibadi al Jannata, Bi Rahmati, Wuktasimuha, Bi Amalikum. We will not enter Jannah because me and you pray. I'm going to say it again. Me and you will not go to Jannah because we pray. We will not go to Jannah because we give salah, or we give uh, zakat and sadaq. That's not why we'll go to Jannah. Me and you are only eligible for Jannah through Allah's mercy. Bi rahmatillah. That's it. If Allah wants you to go to Jannah through His mercy, then you will enter Jannah. But how do you become eligible for the mercy of Allah? It's through your actions. Waqtasimuha bi amalikum. Through your actions, your salah, your zakat, your song, all that will make you eligible for Allah's mercy. Now. Now moving on, inshallah, we will cover the fifth advice today. And he says, and imagine, every single advice, he starts off by saying, Ya ayyuhal walad, oh my dear beloved son, every single advice. Now he goes, he says, Ya ayyuhal walad, ma lam ta'mal, lam tajid. Ma lam ta'lam, ta'mal, lam tajid al ajr. He says, oh, you, oh my beloved son, if you do not act, you will not find reward, right? And then he goes on to a story which we covered last Wednesday and he says, حُكِيَ أَنَّ رَجُلٌ فِي بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلٍ عَبَدَ اللَّهِ عَبَدَ اللَّهِ تَعَالَ سَبْعِينَ سَنَةً There was a person from the children of Israel worshipped Allah 70 years. Okay? فَأَرَادَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَ أَنْ يَجْلُوَهُ عَلَى الْمَلَائِكَةِ What's the word يَجْلُوَهُ mean? For the Arabic speakers. Who knows what يَجْلُوَهُ mean? Who can tell me? Show, kind of show, but more, uh, give me more in depth term. If Allah is, Allah, Allah and yajluwahu, to test him, right? But the correct term, direct translation is to show him. Allah wanted to show him 
and the malaika. Not just show this person, but he wanted to show the malaika also. فَأَرْسَلَ اللَّهُ إِلَيْهِ مَلَكًا يُخْبِرُهُ أَنَّهُ مَعَ تِلْكَ الْعِبَادَةِ لَا يَلِقُ بِهِ دُخُولَ الْجَنَّةِ So Allah sent an angel to tell this man that you have worshipped 70 years but you're not going to go to Jannah. Imagine, you worshipped 70 years but you will not, وَعَلَيْكُمْ السَّلَامَ وَتُكَ But you will not enter into Jannah. How would that make you feel? How would that make you feel about that? You worship 70 years and an angel comes and tells you, yeah. Sorry, brother. What would you do? What's the reaction? What would you do? Would you continue to pray? Khalas, you told me I'm not going to Jannah. Would you continue to pray? The reaction of the normal person would say, No, you already gave me my answer. And you said my 70 years don't count. I'm not going to Jannah. Khalas. So, فَلَمَّا بَلَغُوا قَالَ العابد نَحْنُ خُلِقْنَا لِلْعِبَادَةِ فَيَنْبَغِي لَنَا أَنْ نَعْبُدُ This angel came to this man who worshipped 70 years and he told him, you will not enter Jannah. The man told the angel, he said, well, I was created to worship. I was created to worship. And he created us to worship. And he deserves to be worshipped, so I'm going to continue to worship. Regardless if I'm going to Jannah or not, I'm going to continue to worship. Right? فَلَمَّا رَجَعَ الْمَلَكُ قَالْ He said, when this angel went back to Allah, Allah said, what happened? The Malik replied and he said, إِلَهِ أَنْتَ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا قَالْ You know, Ya Allah. You know what happened and you know what he said. Right? It's like an angelic response. Because it's an angel, right? So he says, فَقَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى إِذَا هُوَ لَمْ يُعْرِضْ عَنْ عِبَادَتِنَا فَنَحْنُ مَعَ الْكَرَمِ لَا نُعْرِضْ عَنْ If this person, even though you told him he will go to Jahannam, and he still continues to worship and he doesn't reject us, then we won't reject him. We're not going to reject him either. He continued to worship us, even though you told him his destination is Jahannam. And he continued, then we shall not reject him. Right? So he says, and he continues on to say, أَشْهَدُ يَا مَلَائِكَتِي أَنِّي قَدْ غَفَرْتُ له. He says, Oh my angels, know and witness that I have forgiven him. I have completely forgiven him. I, Allah, have forgiven this person. Now the thing is, the question is, if someone told us, why do you keep going? Why do you keep going? Why would you keep worshipping? If somebody told you, it doesn't matter, you're going to Jahannam, why do you even keep going? What's the point, right? How is that even possible for this man to keep going? For him, this man, his worship is not a transaction with Allah. Like many of you treat our relationship with Allah. We only get up and pray when we want something from Allah. I have an exam coming up. Let me pray tahajjud. Ya Allah, I wanna, <laughs> I wanna, you know, make sure I, inshallah, I get married. Let me just make, let me get a little bit extra du'a. Ya Allah, I wanna sit in my business and this and that. Let me make sure I get up and pray today. Let me make all my prayers on time, right? But many of us, we don't treat it that way. We think like this. I woke up and prayed fashion. That means today my day should have barakah in it because I woke up and prayed. It should have barakah. In it. You know, I went to pray Dhuhr today, then my day should be good today. I made Asr at the Masjid, so Allah should forgive me. I prayed Maghrib, so Allah should answer my dua. Everything is should, should, should. Allah should, Allah should, because I did this. The transaction relationship. I went to Best Buy, paid for a PlayStation 5, so they should give me the PlayStation 5. <coughs> Your relationship with Allah is not a should relationship. It's not a transactional relationship between you and Allah. And for example, we see this in our own lives. When we make dua consistently, and then our dua doesn't get accepted, what do we do? We stop making dua. You make dua for a whole two, three weeks, four weeks, maybe a year, two years. And whatever you're making dua for isn't getting accepted. Khalas. Many of us stop. We go back to our old ways. We stop reaching back out to Allah. Right? And don't get me wrong, it's not that Allah doesn't want you to ask. 
but it could be even a test for you. Maybe Allah is holding it back from you to see if you'll continue to pray to Him. Because many of us, once we don't get what we want, or once we do get what we want, Allah, semester is over, then that means I don't have to wake up for the Hajjah anymore. I don't got to wake up and pray Fajr anymore. My business is doing good. I can start praying a little bit late. I got the job now. I don't have to pray everything on time. Adi here, here. I did my part. Right? Many of us treat our relationship with Allah as a transactional relationship. And it's the same thing. Think about this. Let's say me and you, Bilal, we're good friends. And I only call you up once in a blue moon. And the only time I call you up is so, yeah, Bilal, you know, I heard uh, you got a dealership, Echi, I'm looking to buy a car. Would you be able to work something out for me? Bilal, you're a nice guy. You're going to, okay, I'm going to take care of you. But what are you going to feel? I only call you once in a blue moon. And when I call you, it's for something. So you're going to feel like you're being taken for granted. Somebody's taking advantage of you. Nah. And I'm going to say this very carefully, these next words. Very carefully, because Allah does not feel what me and you feel. But if you feel that way, when somebody calls you once in a blue moon, every once in a while, and the only time they call you is so their benefit, so they can get something, how does that make, I'm saying this carefully, how does that make Allah feel? Now, our feelings and Allah's, that's not even comparable, we're not even gonna dive into that topic. But if that makes you feel a certain way, when somebody only calls you up for certain things, then why do you do it to Allah? Why do you only pray when you need certain things? Our relationship becomes very transactional because we only reach out to Allah, the one who created you to worship, you only reach out to Him only for the sole purpose that you want something. But that should never be the case, right? And you know, when you make worship unconditional, when you make worship unconditional, once you, stop, once you stop praying to get something back from Allah, then that's when you'll get everything. Let me repeat that again. Once you stop praying to get things back from Allah, but you pray for the sole purpose because He commanded you to pray, that's when everything you've ever wanted will come to you right at your doorstep. Because it's not a transactional relationship anymore. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا يَعْبُدُونَ I only, Allah says, I only created mankind and jinn kind to worship. No other reason. No other, this is your sole purpose. Before everything else, before the children, before the wealth, before everything else, you were created to worship. And this man from Bani Israel understood that. 70 years of worship and he's told he will go to Jahannam and he turns around and continues to pray. Why? Because he knows. Regardless if I'm going here or there, I was made to pray. That's it. That's my sole purpose. So I shall and I will continue to pray. Right? So is your relationship with Allah the same way? That's a question you need to answer for yourself. Is my relationship with Allah the same as that? Where Allah tells us, I created you to worship. Is it the same way? And this doesn't mean, a question that comes up to mind is that somebody might say, well, if I'm praying to go to Jannah, does that mean my prayer is not accepted? Of course your prayer is accepted. Of course, yani, but how long do you have to pray? How is That's not sustainable. When you only pray for a reward, you can't sustain that for 70 years. But when you pray because you understand it's a command and because you love Allah, that's sustainable for 70 years. For example, a mother will continuously and always love her child whether he's seven months old or whether he's 70 years old. She will continuously love him through the whole phases and she will not get anything in return. Correct? She won't get anything in return. But she will love them regardless. But the child on the other hand, you know, I'll only call up my mom only when I need something. Or I'll call her up from time to time. Or see what's going on. Or I'll only act good. Or I'll only be scared of my parents. You know, when you get to that teenage age, you're scared of them. But then you can't sustain that. So you obey them, right? But you can't. eventually you're going to start being rebellious. Eventually you're going to start doing things behind their back. Because you can't sustain fear. You can't worship just because you're, you're afraid of them. You can't worship. That's not, you can't sustain that for long enough. 
But you, what you can't sustain is pure unconditional love. You can sustain the fact that you can worship to Allah for 70 years purely because Allah says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُ You can do that for 70 years. But you can't sit there and say, I'm going to pray just because I want to go to Jannah. Sure, your salah will get accepted, but that's not sustainable. It's not Because once we get whatever we want, we stop. Once we get what we want, we stop. Right? So the main point of this story that Imam al-Ghazali is mentioning is that you have to get to the level of Iman to the point where you reach the level of Ihsan, where you worship Allah as if He is right there with you. And you know He's not there with you, but He's watching you. فَإِن لَمْ تَرَى فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكَ You don't see Allah, but know He sees you. Right? That's the level we all want to reach, inshaAllah. May we all reach that level, Amen. So let's keep going. And then he moves on and he mentions a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he says, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ حَاسِبُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ قَبْلَ أَنْ تُحَاسَبُوا Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, we ha you have to take account of your own self before you are taken account of on the Day of Judgment. حَاسِبُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ قَبْلَ أَنْ تُحَاسَبُوا وَزِنُوا أَعْمَالَكُمْ قَبْلَ أَنْ تُوزَنْ And then also weigh out your deeds before they are weighed out on the scale on the Day of Judgment. Weigh them out. Now we have to mean you have to practice accountability of our own deeds consistently. Every time we pray, is it the same? Your Fajr prayer, were you in the same state as your Dhuhr prayer? Talk to me. During Fajr, are you in the same level of khushur as your Dhuhr prayer? Or Isha, after your whole day is gone, and you worked, and you're tired, and now you're praying Isha, are you in the same level of khushur as you are when you pray Isha during Ramadan? It's not the same. It's not the same, right? And that goes back to the famous hadith of the Prophet Muhammad where he talked about Salah. Salah, when you pray, you only get what you're sincere for. Some people will get half of it, some people will get a quarter of it, some people will get a tenth of it. Imagine you prayed Salah and you're only getting a tenth of the reward. A tenth of Arakah. But that's based on your sincerity when you're praying, right? So when you hold yourself accountable, what that means is after I just prayed Fajr, I look back and say, how was my Fajr prayer today? Was I really feeling it or no? Was I sleepy or no? Or you look back at your Isha prayer, or your Dhuhr prayer for example. Because many of us, there's only what, a two hour span? Between Dhuhr and Asr. And we're at work. So many of us find ourselves right before 2.30 hits, we're trying to get the last four rak'ahs of Dhuhr in right away. Time's flying by. Now you just, Salah is a burden on you. Salah is a burden on you. So you're trying to squeeze in Salah before the next prayer comes. That salah is not the same level of sincerity. It's not the same. And that's when you have to hold yourself accountable. And you have to sit back and say, okay, this salah, I zoomed through it. I prayed it too quickly. I wasn't in the right state. I wasn't 100% there. That means next salah, I'm going to be in it. This is what it means. Hold yourself accountable before you are held accountable on the day of judgment. And weigh out your deeds. Weigh out your deeds before they are weighed out on the day of judgment. So if we keep delaying our prayers, if we keep pushing back, and if we keep counting every little thing, it's going to be an issue. And he continues on and he says, وَقَالَ عَلِيُّ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ مَنْ ضَنَّ أَنَّهُ بِدُونِ الْجَهْدِ يَصِلْ فَهُوَ مُتَمَنْ If a person thinks, if a person thinks that they will reach Jannah without without working for Jannah, then they're just wishful. They're daydreaming. If you think you'll ever reach Jannah without working for Jannah, you're just daydreaming. You'll never get there. If that's what you think. وَمَنْ ضَنَّ أَنَّهُ بِبَدْلِ الْجَهْدِ يَصِلْ فَهُوَ مُتَّعِلْ Now what is that? If you think that you're gonna work because of your hard work, you will reach Jannah, then what? Then what? Then you are... You're, you're over here thinking you're self-sufficient because of your hard work. 
Now, don't those two statements contradict each other? The first statement says, you won't reach Jannah without hard work. And the second statement says, you also won't reach Jannah because of your hard work. They contradict each other. And this is Ali radiallahu anhu who's saying this. So how can we balance that? How can we balance that? Right? So Ali radiallahu anhu says the Muslim exists between both of these statements. You understand that your hard work makes you eligible for the mercy of Allah. Your hard work makes you eligible for the mercy of Allah. You understand that. But you understand you'll never get there. You'll never get the mercy of Allah without salah, without zakat, without salm, without the, the daily actions. A Muslim should exist between these two. And then Al-Hasan al-Basri radiallahu anhu or rahimahullah, he says, this is, he says, طَلْبُ الْجَنَّةِ بِلَا عَمَلْ ذَنْبٌ مِنَ الدُّنُوبِ Asking for Jannah and thinking you're gonna go to Jannah without working for Jannah is a sin within itself. Yeah, bro, la ilaha illallah, I'm going there. But everything else, Saturday nights, Friday nights, Sunday nights, you're a different person. Right? Think you're gonna make it without work, without ishtihad. That's an issue. Hassan al Basri says, This is a sin. If you think like this, then this is a sin. If you think you will make it to Jannah without actually working for Jannah, this is a pure sin, right? And here's the, and this is a fact, this is just a straight fact. Because you'll never get there without actually working for it. You'll never be able to reach it. And if you can't sit here deep inside, believe it, right? The Prophet said in the hadith, he says, Al-Iman ma waqara fil qalb wa saddaqahu al-amal al-amal. Iman is what's deep rooted inside the heart. You have to believe it. You have to truly breathe it. Iman is inside. But what makes your Iman true, what proves that you're a true mu'min, is the actions that you do. And more importantly, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq used to hide his good deeds. We should hide our good deeds just like you want to hide your sins. You don't want people knowing you do this and this and this and this. Hide your good deeds the same exact way. Because level of sincerity changes when you do things in front of people versus when you do it by yourself. That sincerity is not the same. And you know what? It starts getting to your head. When you sit there, you know, there's a fundraiser or you're given a lecture in front of other people. Maybe now I'm not doing the lectures for Allah and to teach knowledge. Maybe I'm doing it for a different reason. And that's where shaitan comes in. Okay, you're not even sincere. Stop the lectures. You're not even doing, you're doing it for the views, aren't you? You want to be Instagram famous. You want to be this, you want to be that. That's why you're doing lectures, right? That's why you're posting Palestine because you want people to see that, oh, he cares. She cares. It, gets, it becomes an issue. And that's why we should always try to do good deeds, as many good deeds in private. And we know the famous story of Abu Bakr Siddiq. When he used to, when he was a Khalifa, after Salat al Fajr, Abu Bakr disappears. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu disappears. Umar being who he is, very observant. Where is this man going every day? So he starts following Abu Bakr from the distance. He starts following Abu Bakr from the distance, following his footsteps. And he sees that Abu Bakr is going to a home in the middle of outskirts of Medina. Amir al-Mu'mineen, what is he doing going to a home in the outskirts after Fajr? What's going on? So Umar waited till Abu Bakr left. Afterwards, Umar went to knock on the door. A lady opens the door. Umar says, what's going on here? He told her, do you know the man who just came to your house? What does he do here? So this man shows up at least once, twice a week and he comes, or maybe it was every day the narration said, I don't remember, I think it was every day. But this man shows up every day at my doorstep. I'm an old lady, I'm blind, he cleans for me, he cooks for the kids, he, he makes sure everything is in place and he leaves. Well, do you pay him? No. 
Do you know who he is? No, he hasn't told me his name. I'm blind. I don't know what he looks like. I don't even know who he is. I almost started to weep. Weep. And he said, Yeah, Abu Bakr, you've made it so hard for us to reach you. So hard for us to even fill your shoes. Nobody knew about this deed. Just Abu Bakr, the lady, and she didn't even see him. She didn't even... Imagine you're the king of the Muslims. You're Amir al Mu'mineen. You're the ruler of the Muslims and you're going to clean people's homes. What king today does that? You see the level of sincerity. These deeds that you do between you and Allah. These are the deeds we need to strive for. You have to strive for these deeds. When nobody else around. Because remember, on the Day of Judgment, when nobody else is around, and you're standing in front of Allah, and Allah starts to question you. And you tell Allah, you will look at you, will tell Allah, you say, Allah, I don't take anybody as a witness. I don't take anybody as a witness except myself. Because you think that because nobody was there, nobody can witness against you. Nobody will witness against you since nobody was there. But what happens? Allah will tell what to speak. Your limbs. Allah will tell your limbs to speak and they will start witnessing against you. So during those times, when you're sinning and nobody's around, remember, your own body will betray you on that day. Your own body, imagine. And in the Quran it's mentioned, you will talk to your own body, what are you doing? Why are you witnessing against me? Do you understand we're both gonna burn? It's not just me, me and you. You're my hand, me and you are both gonna burn. What's wrong with you? And they will say, what is it? Allah is the one who made us speak, Allah is the one who made us speak, and He's the one who makes everything and anything speak. So on that day of judgment, make sure you also show up with plenty of deeds that are between you and Allah and nobody else. Just like when you sin, you sin just between, just by yourself thinking nobody's around, make sure you have plenty of those good deeds as well, right? And may Allah grant us all Jannah and protect us from that day, I mean. And the next thing I wanna say is, moving on, Imam al-Ghazali says, al-haqiqa. What does al-haqiqa mean? The truth. Reality, that's the better word. Meaning it's a fact. 110% you're gonna live this, right? He says, عَلَامَةُ الْحَقِيقَةِ تَرْكُ مُلَاحَظَةِ الْعَمَلِ وَلَا تَرْكُ الْعَمَلِ He says the truth of the matter is, and the reality is, is that you leave noticing the good deeds that you do. You stop noticing all the good deeds that you do, you need to stop noticing it. That man who worshipped 70 years, when he was told, you need to, you're going to Jahannam, he said, all right, cool, bro. Let me just go finish my two rakahs. You done? All right, let me just pray. Let me just continue to pray. It ain't nothing new to me. I'm just going to continue to pray. Why? Because this is, I was created for this. So you need to stop noticing every good deed that you do. Oh, yesterday I prayed five days, five times in a row, all straight in a row, and you know, on time, and you look at me and go, man, I'm proud of myself. I did that. I'm him. No, you're nobody. Allah told that's the bare minimum. That is the bare minimum. Praying five times on time is the bare minimum. You're nothing special. You were commanded to do that. Right? You were, that's nothing special. Because there's a hadith Qudsi of the, where Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He mentions and He says, a way, a way for you to just even get close to Allah is to do what I demanded you to do. In order for you to get close to Allah, you do what I demanded you, what I commanded you to do, that's how you get close. But in order for you to achieve the love of Allah, now there's a difference between having a close friend and somebody you love. There's a difference, big difference. That person you love, you're ride or die, nobody can take out. No matter how many, there's a difference between a close friend, a qareeb, and somebody you love. 
So Allah says in order for you to get close, you do the bare minimum. Five times a day, psalm, zakat, bare minimum. But in order for me to love you, you do all the voluntary acts. Get up and pray to Hajj in the middle of the night. Is it fall? No. But get up and pray it. You know Allah didn't command you to do it, but get up and pray it. In order for you to get close and love Allah and for Him to love you, you start doing all the, you know what? I got four rakahs of sunnah I got to pray before Lord. Let me knock those out. I got two rakahs I got to pray before Fajr. Let me, let me pray them. I got Shafi'ah and Watan tonight to pray. Let me knock them out before I sleep. That's how you achieve the love of Allah. And Allah continues to say in this hadith Qudsi that when this person continues to do this, then he says, I will become the ears he hears with. Everything he hears, he attributes to Allah. I will become the eyes he sees with. Everything this man sees, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, wow, MashaAllah. Have you ever met those people, right? Like, hey, yo, you know, I'm doing this. MashaAllah, SubhanAllah, bro, like that's crazy. Everything they're attributing back to Allah consistently. Consistently, Mufti Kamali, when he was here, he was talking about the mountains, right? And he was like, all I could just constantly think about is the pegs and how they're planted and how Allah and this ayah and this ayah. His brain is wired that way. For us, it's like, bro, it's just a rock, like, big old rock, relax. Chill. And he's like, nah, you don't understand. Allah told us, like, the pegs and how they're planted in these mountains, like, Alim, like, this is crazy. Right? Everything that happens in their life, they attribute back to Allah. Everything. So when you start, and Imam al Ghazali is saying the truth of the matter, you need to stop noticing every little thing you do. You need to stop noticing. It doesn't matter. The person who worships 70 years, he's like, this is just what I do. It's, it's normal. It's a normal thing for me to worship 70 years. Nothing is new here, right? And if you keep noticing the things that you do, you know what starts growing in your heart? Arrogance and envy. Bro, you're not like me, bro. I give lectures every Saturday. Stop it, bro. I give khutbas, bro. Yeah, yeah I'm a hafid, man. I pray five times. I get up and pray to Hajjud. You're not there. I pray Fajr at the Masjid. I don't see you there. Arrogance and envy is developed inside the heart when you start counting and noticing every little deed you do. Who is he, bro? You don't give as much as me. CBA uh, fundraiser coming up. He's not giving the amounts I give. What is this? Why are you, this is not even a comparison. You need to stop noticing the things that you do. And in order for you to combat arrogance, the best way to combat arrogance, right? Is to switch, just take this, you know, a little switch in your mind, turn it off and flip it to praise. Praise who? Allah. Allah allowed me to get up and pray. Allah allowed me to give a lecture. Huh? Monday, I always, me and the guys always like, bro, Sunday night, we got work tomorrow, man. I ain't trying to go, man. You wake up, man, Allah gave me a job. I'm able to work because Allah is allowing me to work. You know how many people want to be? I don't care if it's $12 an hour. You know how many people want to be in my shoes? How come I wasn't born in one of those kids who were in Gaza getting slaughtered right now? But Allah got me here. Allah allowed me to be here. Allah allowed me to go study. Huh? Allah allows me to go pray five times a day. Alhamdulillah. Right? So when you switch everything to a mindset of praise, and even scientists and psychologists say this, when you start developing an ideology of praise, that is the number one key to success. Any famous rich person, Elon Musk, let's take him for example, right? Wakes up 5 a.m. in the morning, does what? No, he doesn't look at his emails, doesn't look at his stock, doesn't look at how much money he got in the... No, 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 no. I just got to take 20, 30 minutes to myself. Counting my blessings. Start, if you want to be successful in life, develop the idea of Hamid in your life. The idea of thanking Allah. No matter how terrible your life or how terrible you think your life is. Once you develop the idea of Alhamdulillah consistently, watch how your life changes. Your perspective on everything changes. Your perspective on everything changes. You know one, one thing my dad always tells me, and this will hopefully help everybody develop a connection with the masjid, right? Ever since I was younger, he would say, you know, when you own a house and you build a big house, a nice house, inshallah one day, you think you're gonna let anybody walk in the house? 
Would you let anybody just walk in your house randomly? You don't even know who they are. Yeah, yeah, come in, come in, come in. My house is your, no. Impossible, you would never do that, ever. He says, think about the masjid that way. Allah will not let anybody walk in the masjid, only those he invites to the masjid. Just like you would only invite certain people to your house and allow certain people, Allah will only invite. So the fact that we're all here today, a special invitation from Allah for you to be in his house. Once you start thinking about it that way in salah, you never want to miss a salah in the masjid ever again. Ever, you never want to miss a salah in the masjid. Allah is inviting me to his house and I get to pray in Allah's house, yeah, I'm there. Once you develop that idea and mentality, it's very hard to miss a salah in the masjid. And that's that mentality and that idea of the salihin. Those righteous people, you know, there's certain people, you tell them, yeah, let's meet up at, uh, let's meet up at 2.20. I'm free at 2.20. He's like, no, 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 I'll meet you at 2.40. I got to pray asr at the masjid. I'll meet you at 2.40, not 2.20. So, uh, adhan is 2.20, iqam is 2.30, I'll meet you at 2.40. Right? And we need to develop that. Because if you look at it, when the boys hit you up, yo, let's go out, yeah, yeah, let me pray real quick. I just gotta pray real quick. What's the word here? Real quick. I gotta pray real quick. And then you're gonna sit there and expect Allah to answer your du'as. And listen, Allah's not petty, we're petty. Allah's not petty. وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثْلُ الْأَعْلَى But how do you expect Allah to answer your du'as when you're, yeah, let me pray real quick. Huh? How does that work? You're not giving him the time of day. You're giving him the real quick. Or you're like, yeah, yeah, let me I'll just pray when I get home. Whether you're working on your car or whatever, whatever the case may be, you have work or you're busy with family or friends, and then you delay salah, how do you expect anything in your life to go straight? But the minute you put salah forward, and the minute you put salah number one priority and you pray it on time, I promise you, every matter and everything you've ever wanted in your life will come right to your feet on time, when it's due. You don't have to wait for it. You never have to wait for it. You know, there's, and there's many stories of Sahabis and many stories of righteous people and scholars. Wallahi al-Azim, some of the poorest people, but whenever they want something, it happens to them. You wonder how they get it. You wonder how things happen. When the simplest things, it makes no sense. It makes absolutely no sense. When somebody is just, you know, you start wondering like, how this person, go, how does he go to Hajj every year? <laughs> how does this person got the money to go to Umrah every year? Like, I know he don't make that much money. But SubhanAllah, those people that are very righteous, that put Salah in the front of everything, nothing will come between them and Salah. Boom. Watch how everything works out. I've even tried this personal experience. Personal experience. Anytime. I have a job interview, engineering job, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, listen, Friday, 12 to two, don't count on me. Don't call me, don't text me, don't teams me, don't email me, nothing. I'm not available, why? It's my time between me and my Lord. I gotta pull up to the message. And you know what? I need you to allocate a little space for me because I have to pray while I'm there from eight to five. I got three, four prayers I gotta make up. I need a space for that. I need that, don't be ashamed of it. Don't think they're not gonna give you the job. If you weren't, if they don't give you the job because you said, I wanted to pray, or I need five minutes of this whole time, I can, I can put it in later if you want me to. But I need those five minutes to pray on time. And they don't give you the job, then that job was never meant to be for you to begin with. That's not the place. But a mu'min, as you should, you should correlate everything you do in your life and connect that back to Allah. Whether it's my job, it's my work, it's my business, it's my friends, my own money, my family, everything has to circulate around Allah. You were only created to worship. Revolve your life around that. Don't revolve worship around your life. Okay, let me squeeze it in here because I got a 10 minute break. Let me, let me just squeeze in, let me pray real quick before Asa comes in. Right? Never want to be that person. And the last thing I want to end up with is this last hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Al-kayyisu man dana nafsahu wa amali lima ba'da al-mawt. 
He says the wise person, al kayis the wise person, is the one who is critical. Mandana nafsahu. The one who is critical, who judges themselves. The wise person, keep this in mind. The Prophet Muhammad spits nothing but straight facts. I'm telling you. This is just nothing. Everything that comes out of the Prophet's mouth is advice that me and you can apply in one way, shape, or form. Everything the Prophet says. In, whether he's talking to a young boy and it's a pneumatic and he's giving him little pieces of advice or he's talking to a, a senior Sahabi who's older than him, doesn't matter. Anything that he says can be applied to our daily lives. And it was said for a reason. He doesn't just speak to speak. It's not what the Prophet does. He doesn't, he doesn't do that. Everything is revelation. And everything can be applied. So this hadith, he says, the one who is wise is the person who is critical of themselves. They judge themselves. They sit there and say, you know what? This last salah I just prayed was a little too quick. It wasn't right. I wasn't 100% in the mood. I wasn't 100% in khushur. I got to fix that next salah. I got to be there. Not when it's time of salah, you don't even think about salah anymore. You're done. Right? No, so, no nothing. You're done. But the wise person is critical of every action they do. And then he continues to say, الموت, And this person, everything that they do, everything that they say, they do it for the Akhirah. They weigh it out, should I say this next thing or will it be against me on the Day of Judgment? Should I do this next thing or will it be something that I will be punished for? Everything they say and do. And especially for us younger people who our mouths are just shh. Cuss word slips here. I know it's hard. We make mistakes. Right? But it's mainly for us. We struggle with that. When a person who's wise, a person who's wise, they can hold that. But a younger person, or even it could be even an older person, it's hard, the tongue is hard. And if there's anything that will make you fall flat on your face, straight into the pit of hellfire is gonna be your tongue. I promise you that. And as there's a, a piece of advice the Prophet says, he said, uh, in the hadith, he said, um, he said, don't say something that will necessitate an apology tomorrow. Don't say something now and then I'm after call you Ammi, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have raised your voice on your hobby. I'm sorry, uncle. You're right. Tomorrow you got you're gonna look bad and it's, it doesn't look right and tough. It's hard. Hey, Shabab, tone it down, please. So it's hard. So be critical of yourself. Judge yourself. Don't let anybody do it for you, but you judge yourself before you're judged on a day of judgment. Right? And think about everything. So he says, الْكَيِّسُ مَنْ دَانَ نَفْسَهُ وَعَمِلَ لِمَا بَعْدِ الْمَوْتِ وَالْأَحْمَقُ What does the word أَحْمَقْ mean? Foolish. Foolish. The one who is foolish. Right? The one who is foolish مَنْ أَتْبَعَ مَنْ أَتْبَعَ نَفْسَهُ نَفْسَهُ هَوَاهُ وَتَمَنَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ This is the foolish person. The foolish person, the أَمْحَقْ the Ahmad, the foolish person is the one who follows their desires and whatever their soul tells them. Hmm? And then they place all their hopes in Allah thinking that Allah will take them to Jannah. You follow all your desires and you do whatever your nafs and then at the end of the day, yeah, we'll go to Jannah. Even young kids today, young kids, right? You, you ask a young kid, you know, yeah, I make mistakes, I'm going to burn a little bit, but then I'm going to go to Jannah. It's a wrong mentality to have. Like, I'm, I'm okay with that. I've lived in Texas, I know what the heat is like. I'm from Libya, I know what it's like over there. No. Don't ever compare it. Ever. So when you sit there and say, yeah, I, it's okay, I can do this and do that. Allah will bring me to Allah is merciful. Allah ghafur rahim. Eh, hey, ghafur rahim habibi. Wa shadeed al -iqab. Don't forget that part too. Allah is very merciful. But He's also severe in punishment. Remember that. Right? And this is the last hadith of Prophet ﷺ, or this is the last piece of advice in this section that Imam al-Ghazali mentions. Right? 
And Allah can forgive anything. But there's one thing He chose not to forgive and it's shirk. Even though He can forgive anything. But He chose not to forgive shirk. That's His line for humanity. Allah can give a person Jannah. He can give anybody Jannah. But He told us, you will only achieve it and attain it through certain actions. He gave us the prerequisites. He gave us the rubric. He gave us everything you need to attain Jannah. Every single thing you need. We have it in front of you. We're not here to talk about halal and haram. That's second grade talk. We're all grown here. You know what you need to stay away from. You know what you need to do. You know what you're lacking on and you know what you need to be better on. We all know that. Every person knows that. It's up to you whether you change, whether you get on the right track, whether your friends help you there. Al-Marwa ala dini, what? Khalila. The person, a man, the person, whether it's a man or woman, they are on the deen and on the religion of their friends. That's it. And nobody on that day is going to be sitting there Saying, yeah, this person used to... No, 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 no. Instead, everybody on that day will say, no, he wronged me. They're trying to get everything they can back to them. Now, he, he yelled at me. He hurt me. He lied about me. She, she, she was talking smack about me behind my back. Yeah, yeah, this... On that day, that's what's going to happen. Nobody's going to sit there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Bro, praise. He used to give lectures. Like, what are you talking about? He's a good person. No, no, no. Everybody's nefsi nefsi on that day. And may Allah protect us on that day and allow us to be eligible for His mercy. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. This is all I have for today, inshaAllah. You know we have a potluck um, that we can uh, you know, enjoy, inshaAllah, together. Inshallah, I can open it up to questions now, bidnillah, if anybody has any questions about what we spoke about today. So, uh, yes, I'm oh, sorry. Before questions can yeah. be announced, there's plates in the back, so. Uh, once the potluck is ready, have the sisters take first. Then okay. Once the potluck is ready, there's plates in the back, sisters first, then Shabbat, inshallah. Yes? I have two questions. One was a comment. In all the jobs I've had, and I've worked since I was a teenager, okay, and I'm in my late 30s now, I, never once when I went for an interview did I tell them, hey, I need this time or this time to pray. Because A, the prayer times change. What I did is once I got hired, I rotated my breaks and lunches around prayer time, and it was my job as a Muslim to find a, a space for me to pray. And there are some jobs where there's not any space to pray, like a restaurant. So where are you gonna go? You're gonna go pray in your car. I only say that because we have new converts here. And again, knowing the job process, especially all the Islamophobia going on now, if you said all that in an interview, you're right away gonna be viewed as a high maintenance employee. And that also goes for those of whom have disabilities. I ha I know people with disabilities. It's not it's not very clear when you look at them that they have disabilities. And I tell them, you go for the interview, you show them why they should hire you, and then you have them adjust whatever they need, you know, ergonomic desk, whatever, to cater to you. But saying all that in front of the interview, except for the Jum'ah window for brothers, I think is a little too too much. Like there's another way around that. And then secondly, secondly, the whole praying, so that it's not a transaction. So is the suggestion that we have some prayers where we don't make dua? I thought that when we make, when we pray, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to make dua, we make dua. Those are very good questions. Uh, first point, the first point I want to address is what you mentioned, right? You say in an interview what you're comfortable saying. That's first and foremost. I'm not telling you you have to. I'm not telling you you should. I'm telling you what I've done and what's worked for me, okay? Personally with me, if I have during, during the time slots when they go down, right? And I've experienced in personal jobs before, where like for example, being on a sales floor consistently, you have to be on a sales floor. And then all of a sudden I disappear for a quick 10 minute break. And then two more hours later comes Asara, I gotta disappear for another 10 minute break. My managers, how many breaks are you gonna take in a day? You're allowed 115 and you're allowed 130. What is it? What are you gonna do, right? So in that sense, I feel like it's obligatory upon myself to let them know in advance, hey, I'm a Muslim. These are my times. Every other time, if you need me to come, 
and stay 10 minutes after for taking this extra 10 minutes, I will do it. If you need to put in a little bit more work, I can do it. But these are things that I cannot negotiate. I have to make my prayers. I'm a devout Muslim, right? It doesn't have to be you demanding anything to them or saying you have to give them to me, but let them know your expectations and why you need to do it in the first place. Most jobs are more, very understanding in the beginning. And that's one thing I've noticed uh, in the majority of the interviews, right? And they, every single time I've used that in my personal excuses, they said, well, thank you for letting us know in advance. We appreciate that. Thank you. Instead of me just disappearing for three, four, 10 minute breaks a day, and then where's this guy going? He says he was online, but he's offline now, and he went, what's going on, right? So I personally would rather have that clarification with my employer first. You do what's always right for you and what you feel comfortable with. If you know that you have a job that you can work around and you get multiple you know, uh, breaks a day and you have that flexibility to change your breaks throughout the day, then by all means, you know, uh, take care of that, right? So you don't, I, I'm not recommending anybody and I don't, I'm not saying you should or you have to. I'm saying, but this is what's worked in my personal experience. Is that a sufficient answer? Okay. And then the second question, I'm just gonna answer his second question, inshallah. Uh, the second question was, should I, you said, does that mean some prayers I should ask and some prayers I shouldn't, right? Was kind of what you went after, okay. Allah wants you to ask. Because when you ask, it's a display of you showing that ana faqir wanta al-ghani. I am poor and you are the one who gives and you are rich. That's 100% the way Allah wants you to ask every single time you put your head on the floor. Every single time you reach out. In fact, He loves that. He loves that. He loves when you turn to Him and you ask Him. Allah loves that. But don't make it purely where all you do is, the only time you do pray is to ask. That's what the point we're getting at. Because some people, they'll leave Salah for months. But then when they need something, exams are coming up end of the semester, right? Something is happening or they're applying for a new job and they want to get accepted. That's the only time they turn back. But instead, our relationship with Allah needs to be an unconditional relationship where I pray to Him when I'm sick. I pray to Him when I'm healthy. I thank Him when I'm healthy. I thank Him when I'm sick. I thank Him when I'm poor. I thank Him when I'm rich. And I pray to Him when I'm poor. And I pray to Him when I'm rich. And I fast when I'm hungry. And I fast when I'm, when I'm full. That's unconditional love between you and Allah. Ask Allah for every single thing you want. Ask for the impossible because He's the only one who makes things possible. Don't ever sit there and say, you know, I had a teacher when I was younger and uh, every time we would sit, we finish Salah, we wait a little bit and then uh, he would say, can everybody ask Allah to bless me with a $10 million? And we'd all laugh. We'd all laugh. There's nothing impossible for Allah. He was a very simple man, right? Very simple man. But there's nothing wrong with asking Allah. He wants you to ask, He wants you to turn to Him and He wants you to come back. But understand that the sole basis of your creation is to worship Him because He told you to worship. You don't worship Allah because you want things to go good in your life. You don't worship Allah because you want that job. You Not don't worship Allah. Things. What was that? Not only. Not only, yeah, yeah, these things, yeah. But make sure that the basis and number one intention is because He commanded me. Then everything else comes with that, you know? Does that answer? Okay, thank you. Your question. Rasul <laughs> Mm, amazing. There's a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad where our brother reminded us and he says, Know Allah during your easy times, your good times. You know, when everything is going smooth for you. Know Allah during those times and Allah will remember you and know you during your hard times. Amazing hadith from the Prophet Muhammad Right? And that's, this goes hand in hand with what we're talking about. Don't just turn back to Him. Only, don't just get on top of your ibadah only when times are hard. Be on top of it at every single time. Every single time. It doesn't change who you are. And this is what the character of the, uh, all the Anbiya and the Rusul were. Sayyidina Ayyub went through what? The unthinkable. But never once did he let go of La ilaha illallah. Never. You know, look at the people in Gaza. What they're going through. And you see videos. Oh, you just lost your children. Alhamdulillah. There's a video of a woman who said, Ya Allah, keep taking from us until you're pleased. 
Atarda, until you're pleased, just take whatever blood you need. Take it. Until you're pleased. They understand and know that no matter what they go through, whatever it is in life, whatever it is, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah is the basis of it. Unconditional love between you and Allah consistently. Good moments, high moments, low moments. Always keep that in mind. Abdul Malik, you had a question. Uh, no, it was not a question. I just wanted to add on what you were saying. Like, if you, you know, set the standard that, oh, I need to pray at this time, at this time, you know, whether you're in an interview or anything, I found that, like, most of the time, they respect you more than even, okay, they won't even say, okay, they might, you know, one day they'll be like, oh, okay, he's doing it today like this. But then the next day they'll be like, you know what? No one else is like, um, especially now, like no one's standing up for what they believe. Amazing. So if you're that one person at that job, you know, at that company, whatever, that actually stands up for their belief and says, no, you know, if you, if you give me this job, I'm going to pray this. If you don't give it to me, I'm not going to take the job. You know, they respect you more. Um, so yeah. Uh, amazing. And also another thing is, Allah can close a door, but open another tent. Easily. Allah can close one opportunity, and another hundred open up for you. I'm dead serious, right? And matter of fact, personal experience with my job today, where only two Muslims work in the company I work for, by the way. Just in our Denver office, over 300 employees, only two of us Muslim. Only two. The question I get asked is, why don't you show up to the holiday events? Bro, all you guys do is drink. I'm not a part of that. <clears throat> oh, Sah, you're right. You know what? Next holiday event, no alcohol. This Christmas, they're having a holiday event. He said, we're doing no alcohol for you. So I'm sorry, I can't show up to you. I don't celebrate Christmas. <laughs> bring whatever you want to bring. Right? But you, you, you see the respect that they're, for one employee, one person. For one person. They want to accommodate, and it's the respect factor in it. They know between 12 to 2 I'm not available, so when we have our meetings, on our weekly meetings, okay, they already account for that. They already account for that. And it's a simple thing. Okay, I'm not gonna be here from 12 to, I will come back and I will put that time in. Whatever you need me to do. Even when I get emails, just yesterday when I got an email, one of my managers, he said, hey, can you complete this task after you finish your prayer? Whenever you're ready, no rush. He understands and knows. And he's not worried about it. He's not complaining to the manager. Man, this guy's in here from 12 to 2 every Friday. What the? Everybody else is working and he's not working. What's, how is it special treatment and this and that? It's really a matter of respect at the end of the day. Again, I want to emphasize, you do what's comfortable with you. And if you feel like the people you're having an interview with might be Islamophobes and might give you a hard time or whatever, and you just kind of need to hold it in a little bit. Sahaba, there was a time where Sahaba had to hide their Islam too, guys. Right? Let's not forget that. There was a time where Islam was hidden. When they would see Umar ibn Khattab, they used to, I'm not a Muslim. Because Umar ibn Khattab was the person who was beating them. Right? There was a time Sahaba used to hide that. And that story, that story of the old lady and the old man who were traveling outside of Mecca, they were leaving Mecca with their luggage. And the husband, he said, oh, I forgot something at the house. He goes back. He says, please watch the bags. Umar ibn Khattab, before he accepted Islam, comes and he sees this lady next to all these bags. He says, where are you, where are you going? What's happening? And she was running away because Umar used to punish them. Be simply because they said, La ilaha illallah. At that moment, this lady had so much courage inside of her and she stood up to Umar. Imagine, Umar was not a small man. He had a presence. She stood up to Umar and she said, you know what, Umar, we're leaving because you punish us. That's why we're leaving. <coughs> Umar replied back and he said, Ma'akum Allah. Allah is with you. He's not even a Muslim. Allah is with you. And he left. The lady is sitting down in shock, cannot believe what just, this is the man who punishes us. What's going on? Her husband comes back and he sees his wife in this state. What's wrong with you? She said, Umar just came up and I stood up to him and he let me go. He didn't hurt me. You know what her husband said? He said, yeah, right. 
He says, لو حمار عمر لو حمار الخطاب I would believe it if the حمار الخطاب أسلم قبل الخطاب He says, the donkey of Umar would become Muslim before Umar himself He wouldn't believe it This is impossible Right? The people with the Sahaba were at a point they had to go to Habasha 100 plus Sahaba 70 of them men, 30 of them women they had to leave their homeland and their homes because of their faith they had to hide it Right? If you feel like in your job interview or whatever the case may be that this person might do something strange or whatever, it's okay 110%, keep it in. If not already, sister, as your hijab already doesn't tell who you are, that's the biggest us, we can kind of get away with it. They mistake us for Mexicans half the time, you know, and that's okay, they're our Muslim brothers. You know, but at least they'll think that we're related and okay, they might give us a pass. They might give us a pass. But sis, you can't hide it. <laughs> you rock with the hijab everywhere. And that's within itself, within itself. Uh, my dad always tells this to my sisters growing up. He says, there's ways you get good deeds that I'll never be able to get, simply by you wearing hijab. You putting on for the religion, I will never be able to get those type of deeds. You got that. I can walk in the street with my pants and shirt, whatever, nobody's gonna say anything. But you have to deal with that, right? And the things that Allah made for your body that you have to do, deal with on a monthly basis and the pain that you go through, that's easy ajr for you that I will never be able to achieve. Yeah? So these are things that we always have to consider, inshallah. There was another hand. Yes, could I, could I ask a question? Sure. Yes, please. Yes? Yes, yes, please. And also, if I may ask, please, when you're using Arabic words, immediately translate them. Like, for example, you used several Arabic words before, like Kushur and things like that. Uh, can you translate it right away simply because they are non, non Arab speaking and there are some new Muslims who do not understand? So it's very important to understand those words, obviously, in the context. No, thank you. Thank you for those pieces of advice. I do get slipped up. A lot of the times, and I just get in the groove, and I Many don't. Speakers do that, and yeah, I'm sorry about that. that so. I'm sorry about that. So that first, uh, the hadith that I'm talking about, the hadith, I it's a hadith Qudsi. You can find it. I'm pulling it from another book called Bidayatul Hidayah, the beginning of guidance. Um, and قال الله عز وجل ما تقرب إلي المتقربون بمثلي أدائم افترضت عليهم. He says, the obligatory acts, he says, Allah the Most High says, those who draw near to me, do not draw near to me with anything better than the acts I have made obligatory upon them. And then he says, وَلَا يَزَالُ الْعَبْدُ يَتَقَرَّبُ إِلَيَّ بِالنَّوَافِلِ حَتَّى أُحِبُّهُ And then he says, Allah continues, and a servant continues to get near to me by voluntary acts of worship until I love him. And then he says, فَإِذَا أَحْبَبْتَهُ And when I do love him, uh, I become the hearing which he hears with. And I become the eyes which he sees with. And the tongue which he speaks with. And the hand which he strikes with. And the foot which he walks with. And it is mentioned in Al-Bukhari. You can find this hadith in Al-Bukhari and it is a hadith Qudsi. Hadith Qudsi means this is sayings and words directly from Allah. Not Quran, hadith Qudsi. Qudsi means from Allah Azza wa Jal. And uh, I apologize for not translating things right away. I will do better with that inshallah. Yes, Amr. Regarding this hadith Qudsi, uh, all of that means is that when we got to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we were listening to you. No. Your, uh, here. 100%. Well, uh, if you can kind of clarify, it. but first, a uh, very quick comment here is regarding the job. Like, some time ago when I was young, the important is job or school or whatever you do, the important is, uh, very important is to communicate with your boss, your teacher, your school administrator, let them know what you want to do. And of course, we have to compromise, like uh, I don't know say, is instead of taking, for example, one, uh, 30 minutes break, they take one 15 minutes break, a bunch. And then instead of 15 minutes break, then you can take five minutes and then you can do a lot during the time. You have to do that, you know, we're all human. Even a Muslim boss will be 
also uh, questioning uh, why should he tell something yeah. to you uh, more important. Uh, the other thing is, like, if, if you can clarify the question, if, if you can clarify uh, the worship of Allah, Ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Clarify what again, sorry? Ibadah, Ibadah, Salah, Siyam, and all these worships. The form of Ibadah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you have the intention of um, you don't want to go to Jahannam and you want to go to Jannah. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to clarify that, since we almost found that in the Quran, uh, for example, Surah. Um, yeah, it's mentioned in the Quran that we, can, Quran, we yeah. should worship because of that reason. Yeah. yeah. So the fear, if you're afraid of Allah. So this, uh, to debunk that uh, some of the Ba'dil thought and the Sufism, the Sufism, some of the Sufism, he would say it. This is wrong, of course. Yes, so the first thing was uh, the uncle asked me to clarify the ibadat. Are you referring to al arkan that you want me to clarify? Arkan, okay. anything. So I'll start off with the arkan, right? Which are the pillars. Pillars. Right? Pillars of Islam. There's pillars of Iman, and then there's Ihsan, right? So the conditions and pillars of Islam is Shahadatu anna la ilaha illallah wa anna muhammadan rasulullah. The first pillar is that, and I know for many of you guys this is basic, but let's, let's take in knowledge as if it's the first time we hear it, all right? So the first pillar of Islam is what? The testimony that there is no God but Allah and that Muhammad is his last and final messenger, okay? Is the messenger of God. That's the first one. The second one is وَإِقَامُ الصَّلَاةِ This one is keeping up the formal prayer, okay? وَإِتَاءُ الزَّكَاةِ Paying alms, charity, right? And that has its own rulings as well in Islam. And then وَصَوْمُ رَمَضَانِ Fasting the month of Ramadan. Obligatory. And performing the pilgrimage, making hajj, and visiting the house of Allah for those who are capable of the journey and who are able. Nowadays, it's a very expensive thing to do. And if you are capable and able to do it, then by all means, you should do it. So these are the five pillars of Islam, and each one of them is a form of ibadah. But also, other forms of ibadah that we can touch on, right? Dua is a form of ibadah. Istighfar is a form of ibadah. Your job within itself, your job, your work is a form of worship. Ibadah means worship, right? Your job within itself, your work is a form of worship. How is that possible? Because you're sitting there, you're working and earning a halal means to, to, to you know, for it to be sufficient for you and your family. And halal means lawful. This means that you're using to uh, to, to you know, suffice your family, to suffice yourself when we live in a day and age in this world where it's very easy to earn unlawful money, right? And haram money and to be engaged in that. Um, and then the second question, Amu, that you had, sorry, I forgot it. So it's just regarding the... Oh, yes, yes. Of the, yeah. Of the thoughts of, okay, you shouldn't be worshiping Allah mm -hmm. because you want to go to one his Jannah and you are afraid of his Jahannam. You should worship Allah for just a law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. And so uh, there's no contradiction for sure. Yeah. That because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, if you worship me according to what I ask you to do, if you are afraid of me, then you have not one jannah, you will have two jannah. Yes, yes. So understand and it, it is mentioned in the Quran that um, when you are Okay, yes, thank you. Uh, it is mentioned in the Quran as well that when we worship Allah, right? We should worship to attain heaven, to attain Jannah and to not go into Jahannam. That is a condition of worship, right? But the basis, 
And at the, again, I want to emphasize the basis of it all at the end of the day, it is a command from Allah. This is what you were created. And like we said, everything else, you are allowed and you should worship Allah because you want to get Jannah. You should worship Allah because you know that He is the giver and He will give. You should worship Allah because you know He is the sustainer and He will sustain. You should worship Allah because you know He is a Latif. You should worship Allah, uh, a Latif, what's the? Gentle. What is it? Gentle. The gentle, subtle. Okay, that is the translation for Allah. So you should worship Allah for all these reasons. All these reasons, right? But understand and make sure that your number one reason underlining everything is because it is a command and He told you to worship. Remember, I'm saying this very carefully here. Very carefully. Allah does not need me or you to pray to Him. Allah does not need me and you to pray to Him. He is Allah, al wahid al qaha whether I pray to Allah or I don't pray to Allah, that doesn't change who He is. He is still Allah. But Allah wants you. Here's the key word. Allah wants you to pray to Him. Allah wants you to turn to Him. Allah wants you to raise your hands in the middle of the night when you're desperate and ask Him. Allah wants these things for you. Okay? He doesn't need it, but He wants you. So hopefully that clarified. What's the translation for that, Sheikh? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created you to test you to see which of you is best in deeds. There you go. Jazakumullah khair. This is, uh, uh, I think it's, I went overboard. I'm sorry, guys. I know we're very, we're very hungry, inshallah. So we will end it here. Uh, next session will be December 23rd. And we will do a potluck that way. Because that's when the holidays are starting, people might be traveling. So, so I'm gonna leave it up to you guys.